Hi, my name is Lima, and this is Resurrecting a Recommendations Platform. So before we really get started in what it means to resurrect a platform, or resurrect a recommend recommendations platform specifically, I kind of wanted to talk high level um, what to expect the next 30 minutes or so. So first off, I'm going to focus on the end-to-end -end machine learning platform, what that means to build an end-to-end -end platform that can orchestrate um, deploying, evaluating, training a model. Um, so this really isn't a case study. And that's not to say like, case, I like case studies as much as the next person, um, but I'm just not going to emphasize on the tech stack. I'm happy to talk about the tech stack afterwards with anyone, uh, if you'd like. Um, but the reason for not focusing on the specific technologies or tools that we selected to solve this problem was because my tech stack is probably different than your tech stack, um, which is different than the next person's tech stack. And you know, some people can easily just jump to AWS, or some people are constrained to their physical infrastructure. So instead of focusing on the tools and frameworks that we utilize, um, I'm just focusing on the holistic view of how to solve an end-to-end -end machine learning platform. So that's point number one. Point number two, um, I'm also not going to really talk about how we utilize recommendations in our Comcast video products. Um, the reason for that is we kind of all know why we need and how we use recommendations um, in our daily lives, whether it's, you know, we're looking at what we should have for dinner in St. Louis or what we should buy on our favorite online retailer or what we should watch on TV. We know the need for recommendations um, and we know where they're pretty much utilized or how they're utilized. So this will be probably the first and last screen capture that you'll see of a recommendation that's produced by my platform that surfaced to um, our Comcast video subscribers. Um, so actually, there's a good story about this. So shortly after I started leading the recommendations team, about over a year ago, I was like, I should figure out what um, I'm being recommended. Because I watch a good amount of TV. I have Comcast at home. What's our platform doing? So you know, I walk home, I turn on the TV, I see, okay, because you watched Wonder Woman, that's legit. That makes total sense. Nailed it. Don't really need to do anything else. Maybe at most I need to like add a like fancy ETL platform and then, you know, pull in A-B testing and then we can call it a day. And then I can move on to the next project. Um, that was definitely not the case at all. Um, this was just like the, okay, this is great, but how are we actually doing this? Um, and the technical debt, once I was going under the hood, the technical debt that we had built from the five years of orchestrating this platform was astonishing, and which was the main reason why we needed to resurrect this platform. And last point, which is really not a point, uh, more so that everything seems better in threes, and I couldn't think of a different third point, um, Wonder Woman. So I like Wonder Woman, and because I'm in the you know, TV, movie, content discovery business, a lot of my examples are Wonder Woman. This will be the last time that you see Wonder Woman for the rest of the presentation. I will do a git stash on her, um, and we'll push forward. So again, hello. Um, my name is still Lima. Um, I'm an engineer at Comcast. I lead the recommendations team. Um, I really like data, and that's a really simple sentence. But the reason why I like data so much is that the way you can analyze data at a large scale and then make, have insights and make decisions based on that data. And that same data can be used to feed your machine learning or deep learning models um, is really impactful. So it's, a, it's kind of my sweet spot. All right. So what does it mean to resurrect a recommendations platform? Uh, let's start from the beginning. Um, but before I start from the beginning, from where the platform was a year ago before we quote unquote resurrected it, um, I'll explain why I have this picture of my cat. Um, so for two reasons. One, this is a serious talk and my cat looks so serious in this picture with an Xfinity shirt on. Um, it's just like her face is spot on. It's like I am serious about Xfinity. Um, and second reason is, so the, recommend, the recommendations platform, um, I wasn't close to it, so I've been working at Comcast for about seven years, and I just recently switched to leading it last year. Um, but in between my start and last year, I was in close proximity to it to kind of see what they were doing. Um, and what I noticed was every year, every few months, there was some initiative to prove the, improve the platform. Um, and what I mean by that is, I think we were realizing, um, and we being, this is before I joined the team, we were realizing that we weren't getting the values that we should be getting from a recommendations platform. So there would be, you know, a few months where we'd be like, let's just focus on the research, you know, and then what that meant is we 
migrated from a collaborative filtering model to a model that uh, utilizes deep learning and neural networks and produces predictions, but it takes far longer to uh, produce those predictions because you know deep learning typical, typically entails using GPUs, and we didn't have GPUs on the physical infrastructure. So then that added a lot of technical debt. So then we went back to collaborative filtering, and then we we're like, okay, well, let's focus on the engineering. Maybe we can make the platform better if we focus on the engineering. Well, that didn't really give us what we wanted. So essentially, last year this time, we were on our eighth life, and it was really time to resurrect it or just give up. We, we didn't give up, obviously. OK, so real quick, before I get into um, the details of how the platform was before we resurrected it, I, I kind of want to mention, since we're all software engineers here, um, and we all know what it means to write code and deploy to production and support it at a large scale, uh, machine learning is a, somewhat of a different beast. Um, if you compa compare machine learning to your standard software de development, for some reason the best practices are not applied, which I, I don't understand why. I have a few hunches, um, but I'm not exactly sure. And I have a few examples. Um, a lot of times with machine learning, what happens is someone's like, I want to solve a problem, and here are a bunch of researchers, and here are a very small number of engineers. So the researcher, researcher, researchers spend a lot of time um, building some model. So let's pretend the end result is a Python script. Um, utilizing TensorFlow, super complicated. Let's not even go to Keras. Let's go deep in the TensorFlow. Why not? Because the engineering team can support that. Um, I'm being sarcastic. Um, so we have this Python script. It's not containerized. We have no idea to deploy it. We just execute it. Um, and we know, OK, here's the input that we need to feed it. And then here's the output. And then we need to do something with that output. Um, but it's just so much more than that. But it's amazing how often like, you kind of get stuck with this black box. And then it kind of takes magic on the engineering side to make that black box into value. Um, so to summarize it, to actually get value from a business perspective, there's so much more to do than just the algorithmic aspect. It's super important. important. The research is, I'm not understating the research side, um, but I think because all, the, all these commercials, I mean, there's a commercial where there's, I think it's Common, or I'm not sure what his name is. He literally is like, AI is the future. This is true, but engineering is a huge part of that. Um, so anyway, so building platforms to support your algorithms is when you'll start to see the benefits. So let's start from the beginning. What were our pain points? Um, so what I mean by pain points are, where do we see, why, why was our platform struggling last year when we were trying to resurrect it? Point number one, infrastructure. Um, so unfortunately, it was constrained to 200 terabytes. However, we needed petabytes worth of storage. Um, so that's obviously a no-go. Um, the optimizations that we had to do were, were like kind of broke my machine learning heart. Um, essentially, when we got to the point where we went over 200 terabytes, we had to decide to train our models with less usage data just to fit our infrastructure needs. So let's say in a perfect world, uh, you have a model that should be trained on like your last 13 months worth of usage because you want to get seasonality. You want to see what they watched last Christmas for this Christmas, or pretending Christmas is now. Um, we had to cut that down because our infrastructure didn't support that. So we were taking a hit on the performance of our algorithms because our, infrastructures didn't, our infrastructure didn't meet our need. Uh, second point is that it was a physical stack, um, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, most of us probably have deployed code on physical, um, physical servers. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think for machine learning, um, it's really hard to scale on a physical infrastructure, and that's kind of alluding to how we resurrected it. I think you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, and then second part is, as our subscriber base increased, our cluster size stayed exactly the same. We didn't have the resources to allocate more resources. Um, so obviously, this platform was built five years ago. So five years ago, our subscriber base on X1 was a lot different than what it is now. And then we obviously saw that by the increase of usage that we had to store on our platform. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't scale to meet that requirement. And the last point that I'm about to make isn't necessarily related to the infrastructure. Um, but more so the software that was running on the infrastructure. We were running a community edition of a popular Hadoop distribution. Um, and I don't know how that sounds to most of you, but to me, doing that in production is insanely risky. Um, so if we had an issue, and Hadoop and like HDFS and Yarn, it's a complex system. Um, so I'm not a Hadoop admin. Nobody on the team was a Hadoop admin. Um, luckily, we had a good ops guy, but at the same time, it's very risky to run community CE edition 
for a production platform um, that's that complex. So anytime we had a problem, who are we going to call? Not the support team. It was kind of stuck on us to fix it. Um, and obviously that would happen when we had to do updates to the, you know, the Hadoop versioning or add parcels or do rollbacks. We, it was a mess. Um, so that was our first pain point infrastructure. Our second pain point was the data pipeline um, or lack thereof. We didn't have a data pipeline. Um, so essentially how we got the data into our ecosystem and, and from like a top level perspective, data is probably the most important aspect of a machine learning platform. I mean, you can't do anything without data. So the fact that we were discopying from one Hadoop cluster to our Hadoop cluster, um, and often that discopy would fail for networking issues or whatnot. Um, there was no monitoring. We had no idea if it failed. We just, we kind of realized like, Two weeks later, oh, shoot, we didn't get any usage. Um, and if we failed to consume data, again, there was no monitoring, so we wouldn't even notice it on the, so at a high level, like your model is trained on usage data, and then you evaluate it. We weren't evaluating it, we were just continuously training it. And then we put those predictions into production. We weren't monitoring our predictions, so we had no idea that our predictions were becoming stale. Um, so it was just no good. It was weak sauce altogether. All right, so our third pain point. Um, was the orchestration of machine learning, and that kind of means a lot. Um, for example, if we made a change to our algorithm, let's say we made a change to our collaborative filtering algorithm, we weighted something differently, um, how long would it take to evaluate that? That would take weeks, like literally weeks to figuring out if this was an okay change, because we didn't have an A-B testing platform in place. Um, and the whole point of a model is to be able to iterate, evaluate, deploy, reiterate, et cetera, go do this whole dance. Um, and we couldn't really do that. We couldn't do that seamlessly. And I have an example. Um, so the, plat the state of the platform last year before we resurrected it, it was very batch sequential. So we would have, we would get this data, discopy the raw training data or the raw data, and then we would, you know, transform it to be our feature data set. And then we would sessionize it, and that essentially that job took 18 hours. And because it was sequential, because that job took 18 hours, the pipeline wasn't doing anything else. We were kind of just stuck. And if you were going to tell me, okay, you're Training your model takes 18 hours. I kind of understand that, but for a job that's transforming data to take 18 hours is, is quite insane. Um, so anyway, so that was a pain point. And then overall, like I said earlier, it's hard to make changes and evaluate, i.e. the lack of an A-B testing platform. All right, so in other words, the best practices for machine learning were missing. And this is super, super high level. Uh, I just broke them into five buckets that I've kind of already spoken to um, already in this talk. So we start with building and training a model. This is where research and engineering get together and figure out, and data scientists figure out what's the problem we want to solve, and then what's, what, what type of model do we want to use for this? Do we want to go the deep learning route where we utilize net neural networks, or do we want to go something super simple and utilize Spark MLlib for like first clustering, and then based on those clusters, we feed it into another recommendations algorithm. There's many ways to go on the model side. Um, and then after you have that, you want to evaluate it. And evaluation is kind of done on the offline sense, meaning um, before it gets to customers, you have these base metrics that you compare every change that you've made to a model. Um, or you compare other models to each other with these base set of metrics. It's like kind of your baseline. Um, it's typically recall or precision, or you can get fancier. Um, and then once that meets, like, check, that sounds good, you deploy for either A-B testing and you do online evaluations, or you skip that and you go straight to production. Um, the key box at the end, monitoring, it actually should point at each part, each um, silos here, because you should really monitor the whole thing end to end. Um, but really, you should monitor it when it's in production. If you've got um, predictions that are being served to customers in production, and if at some point that gets stale and you don't notice it, that's not good. Um, or if at some point you're, let's say you have a model that's supposed to be trained daily and you just aren't monitoring that the data that's being fed to your model is actually fresh and not stale, then why are you retraining your model? Um, so monitoring is a super key aspect of all of this. So anyways, this is the kind of the perfect world in a very simplistic view. And before I go into how we approached tackling this, I kind of wanted to also mention that from my experience the past year and hearing others that utilize, utilize uh, machine learning at Comcast, Rarely is the bottleneck um, on the machine learning side. It's usually on the engineering side. And again, that goes to the reason why when we talk about machine learning, the focus is always on the research, and it's rarely on how do we build a resilient platform that can help orchestrate that. Um, and it's the typical problems that 
we have as software engineers. It's infrastructure, it's building resilient data platforms that can scale. It's, it's nothing new to our lives, but when you add machine learning, it makes it somewhat complex. All right, so taking a step back, um, what do we really need to do to support the life cycle of a machine learning model? Um, in other words, what do we need to do to resurrect this recommendations platform? So the real meat of this discussion. All right, so this is a lot of boxes and words. And again, because I didn't want to make this a case study and I'm happy to discuss what technology stack and tools we use to facilitate this. Um, so I took out what the frameworks we're using, except it looks like I left Spark there, so ignore that we use Spark. Um, but for the most part, this is like the life cycle of what I just discussed. You have your data platform, you need to sometimes like uh, transform that data to create feature sets, or sometimes the data is already stored in the way that your model wants to use it for your training. And then you evaluate, and then you deploy. And this is a super simplistic view. Um, to dumb this down, let's break it up into four key components. Um, there's your infrastructure, which I spoke to earlier. Uh, there's your data platform. There's your workflow management, which is super critical. I actually didn't realize how critical this was until after we started getting into the meat of running more than one model in production at a time. Um, and then your monitoring and performance metrics, which is also super important. So we're gonna go into details on all of those next. All right, infrastructure. So I kind of alluded to this earlier when I mentioned physical stack. Um, obviously, I was going to my, we, were my, we decided to migrate to the cloud. Um, and the, not only did the, I should, it shouldn't say for us, cloud computing opened doors for machine learning, not just us. Um, the computation power with GPUs and the ease of kicking, standing up instances in production is it accelerated our growth and our speed to resurrecting this platform. Um, when we start, for example, so I keep mentioning these two models that we have. We have this, this, this core collaborative filtering model and then we have this deep learning model. Um, and honestly, we, there's no way we would have been able to experiment with this deep learning model on this physical infrastructure. So migrating up to AWS was super key to that obviously because of GPUs. Um, and then easily to scale in and out, elasticity. Um, these are all, I mean, these are all reasons that most people migrate to AWS, um, but they're extremely beneficial from the machine learning aspect. So a few more points about infrastructure. Um, since we moved to the cloud, it brought new problems, better problems, but new problems. Um, we had to be really cognizant of pricing. There's a story, a quick story we have where um, when we first migrated, so it wasn't a lift and shift for us. It was like lift and shift, meaning we didn't take our MapReduce jobs and then just run them in AWS. We actually re-implemented our whole platform, and that took a long time. Um, well, we re, re, not re-implemented, we redesigned our platform. And uh, one of the things we were doing was the first step was to build our data pipeline. So we had a resilient, event-driven data platform that was just beautiful and amazing, and we could all get tattoos of the architecture on our arms. That's how amazing it was. Um, so the first step we did was we looked into the main like, framework that we wanted to use to consume the data. Um, so typically, the way it is, is you either you consume data from like Kafka or Kinesis. And there are obviously other options for us is Kafka or Kinesis. And we are exploring going the Kafka Connect route um, for Kafka and then the Lambda route for Kinesis, because AWS managed services work really well together. Um, However, so when we were exper experimenting with Lambda, um, there was this one day where we kicked off the Lambda function, we had debug logging on, we had CloudWatch obviously on, and it resulted in, I think, over 20,000 in three hours from logs, um, which, again, is a problem. It's a nice problem to have because that means it's not a nice problem to have. <laughs> From a finance perspective, it's not nice at all. But it's nice that we can just spin up Lambda functions and consume data. So you have to be wary of that when you move to the cloud. Um, and then the last point, which doesn't kind of make sense, so I have to really talk to it, is it's really easy to spin up instances. What I mean by that is it's really easy to just pick a technology stack and deploy. Um, whereas in your physical infrastructure, you're kind of constrained to the resources you have. So what we were finding was at a certain point, the team kept growing as we kept improving the platform. So it went from three people to 10 people. And at some point, it's really hard to like, keep an eye on like, the bigger picture. And there were folks that were you know, spinning up Lambda functions and then you know, Redis clusters. And what we went down the uh, DynamoDB route. And then someone wants to stand up a Cassandra cluster. And we were just 
picking too many technologies because it it's easy to do in AWS. So then you start getting a lot of technical debt of like, is this really all make sense? How are we really deploying this? Terraform I really came to play later rather than sooner. I wish it came in sooner for us. Um, anyway, so just be cognizant of, because you have the luxury of, luxury of being able to spin up anything in AWS doesn't mean you should. All right, so that was infrastructure. Um, how we solved that was moving to the cloud. Now let's focus on our data pipeline. Um, so like I mentioned, cloud infrastructure allows us to scale when data fluctuates. This is something that we didn't have before. Um, our goal was to build an event-driven platform, meaning it didn't really want it to be so batch. Um, by that, I mean, in our previous platform, we would get this disk copy of data that reflected the usage from the previous day, and then we would do something. So there was a, a quite, uh, there was a lag in that. Um, I wanted to monitor our data platform so that we would never get into point where we had stale data. And then I really wanted to focus on data stability and quality. And that means two things. That means the quality of the events that are available um, that you're consuming, and then the stability. So this goes a long way. For some reason, the past year, it's been our part-time job to keep moving from one Kafka topic to another Kafka topic to another Kafka topic, that all of the same events, but for some reason, we just have to keep following the flow of data. Um, so it's, it's really important once you decide to go the machine learning route to make sure that you have stability in the data. And if you don't, then you're really, it's gonna be really difficult to solve the problem at hand, which is you know, producing predictions to do something. All right, so another quick note on data pipeline. Like I mentioned, be careful in the data that you decide to use as your feature set. If support for those signals or that data set will be deprecated, you kind of are screwed. So be careful in what you choose. The way we handled that is we decided to rely on raw data as much as we could um, instead of enriched data that was enriched by upstream clients or downstream clients and take on the enrichment on ourselves. Um, and again, that goes to the point that the stability and the quality is super critical. Okay, so we went from this, which was our platform, our data pipeline. I don't, it's not even a pipeline. This is our data pipeline last year. Um, so we got the data disk CP usage data, which was in Avro format. Um, it was written to our HDFS cluster, and then we had a MapReduce job that transformed it. Unfortunately, we transformed it from beautiful Avro to plain text. Um, and then that was written out to HDFS, and then we sessionized it, and this is the job that took 18 hours, probably because it was reading plain text. Um, so this was the before, and we don't, we don't deal with this anymore. And this is the new. It's really simple. We built like a pretty simple ETL system right here um, that had a lot of code that could be shared, which is also the goal. Um, so let's, let's pretend we're starting from scratch and we, get, we have a bunch of usage data that we care for. Let's say we care for what you watch and then what you've searched for and then what you voice. These are all different um, topics or streams available in Kafka and Kinesis. And then so for each one of those, we stand up these three Lambda functions. Um, and again, there's a lot of code that's being shared and a lot of uh, like Terraform and all that good stuff is being shared in between these, so it doesn't seem as complex as it might look. Um, so let's pretend that the use case is for the data that you search for. So the search events come in through, are available in Kafka. We set up the first Lambda function to get that raw event and write that to our S3 bucket. I also lied, I'm, this is kind of a case study, I'm telling you what our tech stack looks like. Um, so. Uh, we get the raw and then we write that out to our S3 bucket. The rule of thumb is don't ever delete raw, keep raw, because you might have a bug in your transformation code or you might, you know, for some reason your transformation like tier or your transformation lambda function fails, you wanna make sure you have the raw so that you could reprocess it. Um, and then once that file is written out to S3, we have a subsequent lambda function that gets triggered that converts from plain text, which is for some reason usually how we write data into uh, Kafka or Kinesis, and then we transform that into Avro because no job should ever read plain text. Um, no data processing framework plays well with that. Um, and then the subsequent Lambda function essentially enriches it with metadata. Because the first step usually in all machine learning platforms is you need your usage data and you need your metadata, why not join the two so that you don't have to add that complexity to your model to do that. Um, and then we have our little metadata stack, which consumes metadata from essentially a database or a data service, writes a snapshot to S3 and writes, a, writes incremental updates in the bootstrap version to Dynamo. So that's a high level of our data platform. That was a not, I wouldn't say an easy win to go from here to here. It took a long time 
took a lot of failures. Um, oh, and then Redshift actually has been a huge component in our life. Um, so we s query Redshift to extract training data sets and validation data sets for our models. Um, Redshift is, is legit. All right, so coming back to this view, we talked about our infrastructure, we've talked about our data pipeline. Um, now let's focus on the workflow management and monitoring and performance metrics. All right, workflow management. Um, workflow engines help orchestrate comple complex systems. Um, from a machine learning perspective, usually we don't want to train models with less data, but rather with more data. And we're seeing that especially with our deep learning models. The more data, the better the predictions will be. Um, and as data grows, we need to retrain those models faster while consuming fewer resources. Um, we also want to refresh models more frequently to avoid stale predictions. And what I mean by that is typically when you have a model, you don't just train it once and then produce those predictions and don't touch it again. You train it at a certain frequency. At Comcast, we train our models every day depending on where it's being served um, to our customers on our video platform. Um, so anyway, so that's a key aspect of the model life cycle. So before, machine, before, before workflow management, um, machine learning and data pipelines were run through a series of scripts um, or ad hoc commands. We all know what that means. Um, so training and serving a model meant manually triggering and waiting for a series of jobs to complete. For example, job to transfer the data, transform the data after that ran, then load the data, that was a different job, then train the model, then validate the model, and then deploy the model's production. Those are all a series of steps. Um, and this is where workflow management comes into play. Um, so there are tools that are designed to schedule and automate machine learning pipelines and data pipelines or any sort of pipeline, and they're super critical to make your life easier. Um, there are obviously open source tools available with sophisticated interfaces, depending on the tool that you pick, um, to allow for managing DAGs. It's all about DAGs um, and scheduling and all that good stuff. Uh, examples are Airflow, Uzi, Azkaban, and Luigi. We actually went through a lot of experimentation with all of them except for Luigi. So we started out with Uzi. Um, that was okay. That was obviously on our physical infrastructure with the uh, well-known Hadoop distribution that we were using. Um, and then we migrated off of that and we went to Azkaban. This was before we started Resurrect it, so this was years ago. Um, and then as of when we started Resurrect it, we started to utilize Airflow. I'm pretty happy with Airflow so far. All right. So it's workflow management, and you obviously can see the importance for that. Next is monitoring um, and performance metrics. So for developing, you need to standardize the, way, uh, the ways to compare models. Um, it's different than software development. Typically for software development, you have some business case and you want to solve. You write that code, you unit test it, your QA team tests it. It meets those business requirements, then you deploy. Um, when you have models, it kind of follows that, but you also need a baseline to compare when you make changes. Um, so you have common metrics like recall, precision, there's a slew of them. Um, but the whole point of having those is so that you can compare and then evaluate. If you don't have them, then what do you, how do you really evaluate the quality of your predictions? Um, so monitor your model's accuracy once it's deployed in, into production. That is also using those common metrics. So not only are you deriving recall and precision on an offline sense when you're changing your model, but you're also doing it on the online sense while it's running in production. Um, with the goal being to determine if your predictions are becoming stale. So if it becomes stale, then you need to retrain it. All right, so this graph is a snapshot from our recall from one of the models that we were evaluating back, in, back over the winter in February or March or so. And what I like about this is that it shows that data fluctuates on two parts. It shows that data fluctuates based on the time of day and data fluctuates based on the use case. So the blue line is recommendations for TV shows. Um, and if you know anything about recommendations, it's a lot easier to recommend TV shows because your TV show viewing habit is kind of the same. You will always watch the next episode of This Is Us um, because that's the show that you watch, but you won't always watch the same movies. So it's very hard to predict, well, it's not very hard, it's harder to predict movies than it is to predict TV shows, So which is the red line of uh, the movies, which is why the recall or the precision is slightly lower. What I like about this is that this was taken during the Olympics, I think, um, and there's a dip right there, um, and that dip, or there's, yeah, that dip kind of correlates with viewing behavior, because that means data fluctuates. People are 
everyone's watching the Olympics, no one's really watching what we're suggesting them because we unfortunately only use nine months worth of your usage, so we had no idea that you liked the Olympics. Um, so yeah, so what this is supposed to portray is A, based on the time of day um, or the seasonality, your data will fluctuate and you need metrics to evaluate those changes. Um, and then even taking into account your context, like what you're serving, you need to have data that reflects that, movies versus TV shows, for example. All right, one last point about monitoring and performance metrics. Um, you also need to track the data quality um, of both the data that's fed into your model and the data that your model produces. Meaning you don't want to feed your model stale data or data that doesn't accurately reflect what customers are doing in production. Um, and then you also need to monitor and evaluate the predictions that your, um, that your, data, that your platform is producing, your machine learning platform is producing. Um, so both from a historical distribution of your data sets, so you can track the distribution of the data you used to train a model three months ago versus the data you use to train your model today. Like for example, if you train your model today and the data is completely different than it was last week, there's an issue there. And if you feed that into your model, you'll obviously have issues and you'll think it's your model's fault, but really it's your data, it's your data pipeline or the source of where the data comes from. So monitoring everything when it comes to data is super critical, not only the consumption of it, but the quality of it um, and how you're using it. All right, so we're actually reaching the end to this, of this talk. To sum it up, four key tenants needed to resurrect a recommendations platform so that we could support the life cycle of your algorithms. Uh, one is your infrastructure. We talked about how we migrated from the physical stack to AWS. Two is our data platform. We talked about how we migrated from that, whatever that was, to a true ETL system. Um, three, utilizing a workflow management to orchestrate everything end to end, not only your data pipeline, but also your machine learning pipeline. And then four, monitoring and performance metrics for all of the above. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>